and the citation reads, the Mahatma Gandhi Satyagraha Award presented to Dennis Goldberg on the 18th of September 2012 in recognition of your courageous, outstanding and relentless contribution to the struggle for the liberation of South Africa. Looking this way, please. My comrades and friends and the dignitaries and Comrade KK, who gave us such support in the struggle for freedom. After I was released from prison in 1985, I ended up in Zambia, and I walked down Cairo Road, and I saw, even amidst the poverty, what freedom could mean for the self-confidence of the people. I got jostled into the road, Sometimes somebody else got jostled into the road, but there was no animosity. And I felt, well, we're on the way as South Africans. I must tell you that tonight I'm a li little bit of a dilemma. When Ella told me that, or her organization told me they were going to award me this Satya Graha Award, I said, but I took up arms, you know. Uh, I didn't sort of add the detail that I was the commander of the first Mkonto Wesizwe training camp inside South Africa. Of course, that came back to haunt me a little bit, got me four life sentences. Um, but I had some great moments during that trial with Nelson Mandela as the number one accused, and Walter Sisulu next to him, and then me, and uh, Umgov uh, Mbeki, and other great comrades with us. And Nelson Mandela made that speech that took four hours, in which he explained why he had taken up arms and issued the call to take up arms. Uh, you heard, saw a little excerpt, there was the need to overthrow a tyrannical regime. We had tried everything else, and the proportions in South Africa as compared with India were a little bit different, in the sense that at the time there were 400 million Indian people and 10,000 British soldiers and administrators, and they could go home to England. No country in the world was going to take five million white South Africans who believed in apartheid. Do you think they wanted our policemen and bricklayers and miners and the hateful attitudes that they held? And so there was a different kind of struggle. We took up arms to bring peace, it's true. Because apartheid depended on violence as an integral part of its very system. And we took up arms to put an end to that system so that we could live in peace. And we've struggled to do that since. I want to say that in the end, Nelson Mandela inside prison and Oliver Tambo outside with his comrades, and Oliver Tambo doesn't get the recognition he deserves for 30 years of dedicated leadership that brought us to freedom, and he then died without actually enjoying the fruits of that leadership. 
But he and Nelson Mandela were such close comrades, can I say bosom buddies. There was no rivalry. And when O.R. gave over the presidency to Nelson Mandela, he said, you entrusted the ANC to me. I've cherished it and I've nurtured it and I hand it back to you stronger than ever. And in effect, please look after it. Tremendous words of selflessness. But he was commander in chief of our armed struggle as well. So forgive me, Ella and the Trust, if I raise these contradictions. And if I say to Sue Britton, thank you for taking up the issue of uh, end conscription campaign and getting young white soldiers not to occupy the townships. But it did take religious and faith groups a very long time to arise, come to the point where they had to act on moral grounds. Thank you for doing it. Sitting in prison for 22 years, I have to say I wish you'd done it earlier. Uh, forgive me for putting it that way. But you see, we did have an armed struggle, and not until, not until it was said, not a graveyard, white graveyard in South Africa was not occupied by young whites who had been killed in the defense of apartheid. Only then could young whites begin to say, the moral pressure on me is too great. Now, I'm no theologian, but I was released in 1985, the year of the Kairos document. Kairos, I read in the document by Christian theologians, is a Greek word for a moment of crisis, of moral crisis, when one has to re-examine all one's beliefs. And even the Kairos document raises the issues of wealth and poverty, of power, of violence, the need to resist, and in certain circumstances justifies the taking up of arms against a tyrannical regime. So you see how I'm caught in this because I believe in peace. Let me fast forward to Americana. A very serious situation. My father was a trade union activist, shop steward, led strikes. And he was a, born in England, I was born in South Africa. And so when I see workers not in unity, I'm appalled by this. Now we tend to talk about Americana as a place where 45 people lost their lives. And we talk about the massacre of 45 people. But for me, as a believer in working class unity, there were two incidents. The first was when workers killed two lowly paid policemen, two security guards, and six other workers. Workers were killing workers. How can this be in our country? We really have to do some work can we just lay it down to desperate poverty, desperate wishes to change? May I, as a non-African person, ask, where is this Ubuntu we talk about? Has our society so destroyed, to echo Mewa, our values of human life itself? Do we just kill each other? When policemen are killed, and they are killed every week in our country, tragically, because of the deaths of violence and criminality, who do we blame? You know, we ended the apartheid system by negotiation. It was financially and morally bankrupt, partly because of the armed struggle, of the tens of thousands of Nkwonto people and some others in camps who could not be allowed to march by the apartheid regime to take over South Africa. 
They militarized the state, they bankrupted the state, and in the end, Cold War was coming to an end. There was the need for a peaceful transition. And we, led by OR and by Nelson Mandela, agreed to the talks and negotiated a peaceful settlement. We didn't defeat them militarily. We could not impose our will. We had to do a deal that left economic power in the hands of the haves. And I'm amused, or cynically amused, by our media talking about the Lonman mine and the poverty of workers and low pay. Our media say, what's the matter with these capitalists who think only of profits and not of workers? Don't you find it amusing? I'm a communist. This I've, this I've fought against all my life, this terrible exploitation. I fought against apartheid, not just because it was the oppression of white people over all black people or non-white people, but because it was a system of cheap labor and massive exploitation. If you go back to 1909 and the, what did they call it, the National Convention of White Politicians that set up the Union of South Africa, they spent a year talking about how they would control the lives of Africans to ensure cheap labor for the mines, for the farms, for industry and commerce. That was apartheid, comrade. And when we did the deal to end apartheid, hmm, we have black economic empowerment for people who have acquired all the attitudes of big capital in their relation to the exploitation of workers. I can mention names, and perhaps I should. We have members of the National Executive of the African National Congress who are directors of big mining companies. Some are even chairmen of big mining companies. Do you think their companies pay better wages or create better working conditions for their workers than any other companies? Of course they don't. They're capitalists, they're there to make profits. And so I have to say to those who have inherited the privileges of property and wealth and education, like me and many others, what are we doing about it? How are we going to close the gap between low paid workers and better paid workers and managers? I heard the appalling figure that the general manager of Vela Panda Holdings earns over a thousand times more per year than low paid worker. How can that be? How can it be that the women who work in the supermarkets take home, if they're lucky, 30,000 rands a year, and the CEO takes home 30 million a year? Something wrong with our society, comrades. And so, how are we going to take on the peaceful struggle? I do believe in peace, despite having taken up arms when it was necessary. How are we going to, well, I don't see the possibility of a socialist revolution right now, you see. <coughs> Just to be honest about that. How are we going to take on highly skilled workers who love it when there's a 10% increase across the board because 10% of their 200,000 a year is 20,000, which is just about more than the annual wage of low paid workers. Their increase is more than the annual salary of low paid workers. How are we going to stop that across the board process and managers with their huge salaries, and civil servants, and chief directors and director generals, those of you sitting here, my comrades. Don't you give me comrades, really? Premiers and cabinet ministers 
who allowed Jagras to set their salaries, and Jagras, yeah, Zach, formed a committee that determines the salaries of top people, because they're totally impartial, you see. And what are the norms they adopt? The social divisions of apartheid that we've inherited. This is the tragedy of our country and our constant calls for equality. When we have formal political equality, and for those who've struggled out of the mire of poverty into top jobs, the advertising industry called them black diamonds. Can you believe this? You know, they're the ones who import the expensive uh, Mercs and BMWs so that they really look good, you know? Doesn't matter about the poor. Spending the poor's money from taxes. How are we going to take them all on in a serious socio-economic struggle for the future of our country. And I would say it is in the enlightened self-interest for the haves, who are no longer just white, there are plenty of others involved, how are we going to persuade the haves that they have to sacrifice something, quite a lot, to ensure that the lowest paid and those in the deepest poverty are going to see a massive and quick improvement in their lives so that workers don't feel so desperate they kill workers. March armed, armed workers, and police react and overreact, I believe, but I'm prepared to wait for the Commission of Inquiry to report because serious stuff we're talking about. In the interest of protecting property and the wage distribution that we have. So coming back to why did I accept this award, Ella? I wanted the opportunity to try out these ideas. <laughs> I've been thinking about them a long time. I've been deeply concerned for a long time. I must say that I've not wanted high political office. I was assured I could have it if I wanted it. But I wasn't in the struggle for my benefit. I was in the struggle for equality, for humanity. And because, well, I've been married twice and my widows have left me quite well off. They were comrades as well. Um, so I'm not in want, I have to confess that. I wish I could help more. I wish the ideas I had put to leading politicians about these issues of closing the gap between the wages of entry-level workers and cabinet ministers way back in 1995 had been listened to. I wish people had listened then about the need for some more central planning of the growth of our economy. I'm glad that the president who derives from KwaZulu-Natal, President Zuma, has set up that planning commission. Really admire him for it. Everybody accuses him of not being an intellectual. There's been a lot of intellectual development in government. I'm impressed with it. Peace, believe in peace. I'm deeply honored to be given this award and I'm deeply honored for another reason. President Kaunda quoted from our Freedom Charter, we declare for South Africa and the world to know that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white together. We ended that Freedom Charter with these freedoms we shall fight for side by side all our lives until we have won our liberty. Well, in the formal sense, we've won the liberty. Let me echo Sue, a luta continua indeed. And we're living in a time 
When that idea of South Africa belongs to all who live in it is being drowned by an impatient group of young black African leaders whose view is South Africa belongs to black South Africans alone. A very narrow national chauvinism. I know where it comes from. I know the origins of the belief. But as a moral human being, as we all are, otherwise we wouldn't be in this hall tonight, we know that we can make personal choices about what we support and where we should be going. There are national minorities, not just whites, colored people in the Western Cape who are told they're superfluous, too many of them. There's still racism of Indian, African kind. I'm very happy to hear about Inanda being a place of tranquility. But there are others in KZN who play on these differences and historic differences. Comrades, there's a hell of a long struggle ahead of us. That's why I accepted this award, to be able to say to you, thank you for honoring what I've done. I'm nearly 80. My plan is to last till over 100 because there's so much still to do. Join me in doing it. Thank you.